This is the Wikipedia page for History of the World, Part 1, Part 2. You're listening to the podcast where we read Wikipedia pages and provide commentary. Welcome to Wikilisten. I'm Victor Varnado, KSN. And I'm Rachel Teichman, LMSW. All right, let's get back to History of the World, Part 1, Part 2. Mel Brooks, you're a genius. The French Revolution. In her tavern, Madame Defarge, Cloris Leachman, incites a mob to plot the French Revolution. Meanwhile, King Louis of France, Brooks again, is warned by his advisors, Count de Monet, played by Harvey Corman, and mistakenly called Count de Money, by the king, and his associate, beer mace, Andreas Boutsinas, that the peasants do not think he likes them, a suspicion reinforced by the king's use of peasants as clay pigeons in a murderous and humorous game of skeet. A beautiful woman, Mademoiselle Rimbaud, Pamela Stevenson, asks King Louis to free her father, who has been imprisoned in the Bastille for 10 years because he said the poor ain't so bad. He agrees to the pardon under the condition that she have sex with him that night, while threatening that should she refuse, her father will die. He gives her 10 seconds to decide between hump or death, and at the last second, she agrees to hump. Is this rape? You mean in this movie? Yeah. Yeah. There are lots of movies that depict uh, rape or people coercing people into sex. Well, sure. I just I just wasn't yes. expecting. Okay. I mean, I'm saying rape is bad, obviously, but it also is a type of thing that I would think that kings in the past would have done without a second thought. Oh, I'm sure. I just yeah. wasn't expecting it to come up. De Monet manages to convince the king that the revolution is building and he needs to go into hiding, so they will need a stand-in to pretend to be him. Thus, Jacques, also Brooks, the garçon de pisse, a.k.a. piss boy, whose job is to hold up buckets for the king and his advisors to urinate into, is chosen to impersonate. Later that night, Rimbaud, unaware of the subterfuge, arrives and offers himself to the piss boy who is dressed as the king. As she invites him to take her virginity, he pardons her father without requiring the sexual favors. After Rimbaud and her senile father, Spike Milligan, return from the prison, the peasants burst into the room and capture the piss boy, King, and Rimbaud. They are taken to the guillotine for the crimes committed by the crown. When asked if he would like a blindfold or any last words, Jacques declines. However, when they test the guillotine, Jacques makes a final request for Novocaine. The dialogue recognizes this as an anachronism when the executioner declares there is no such thing known to medical science, to which Jacques replies, I'll wait. (laughs) Just as Jacques is about to be beheaded, Rimbaud muses that only a miracle can save him now, and Josephus arrives in a cart pulled by miracle the horse from the film's Roman Empire segment. They all escape Paris, riding away in the cart. The last shot is of the party approaching a mountain carved with the words, The End. Just want to point out that the uh, rape did not happen <laughs> in the story. Just uh, because we, we had stopped in the middle. Just letting you know that it doesn't happen. So uh, I'm just hoping to calm your nerves about that. Thank you. Previews of coming attractions. The end of the film presents a mock teaser trailer for History of the World Part 2, narrated by Brooks, which promises to include Hitler on Ice, a Viking funeral, and Jews in Space, a parody of Star Wars and The Muppet Show. Imagine being cast to have to, like, dress up and act as Hitler in a movie. People have done it, right? Yes, they have. Despite the preview, there was originally no plans for a sequel to be released. The part one of the film's title was originally intended to be an historical joke. The History of the World, Volume 1, was written by Sir Walter Raleigh while prisoner in the Tower of London. He had only managed to complete the first volume before being beheaded. However, in 2021, a sequel was announced to be in production as detailed below. All right. Let's get this cast listed. Here we go. Reading some credits. Mel Brooks, Moses, Comicus, Torquemada, Jacques, and King Louis the Sixteenth. 
Dom De Luis, Emperor Nero. Madeline Kahn, Empress Nympho. Harvey Corman, Count de Monet. Cloris Leachman, Madame Defarge. Ron Carey, Swiftus. Gregory Hines, Josephus. Pamela Stevenson, Mademoiselle Rimbaud. Shecky Green, Marcus Vindicus. Sid Caesar, Chief Caveman. Sammy Shore, Prehistoric Man. Mary Margaret Humes, Miriam. Orson Welles, Narrator. Carl Reiner, God's Voice, Uncredited. Ancient Rome cameos, Howard Morris, Court Spokesman. Charlie Callis, Soothsayer. Paul Mazursky, Roman Officer. Henny Youngman, Chemist. Hugh Hefner, Entrepreneur. Barry Levinson, Column Salesman. John Myers, Leader of Senate. Dina Dietrich, Competence. Fritz Field, Mater D. John Hurt, Jesus. Art Matrano, Leonardo da Vinci. B. Arthur, the employment insurance clerk, uncredited. <laughs> Ronnie Graham, Oedipus. Pat McCormick, plumbing salesman. Spanish Inquisition cameos. Ronnie Graham, Jewish torture victim number one, hot poker. Jackie Mason, Jewish torture victim number two, ping pong. French Revolution cameos. Andreas Butsinas. B. Mace. Spike Milligan, Monsieur Rimbaud. John Hillerman, Rich Man. Andrew Sachs, Gerard. Fiona Richman, Queen. Nigel Hawthorne, Executioner. Bella Imbird, Baguette. Now, how did they get the entire original cast to be in the sequel if like half of them are dead? Who said the entire original cast is in the sequel? It says, however, in 2021, a sequel was announced to be in production as detailed below. Right. That means later. They're not saying that this is the sequel. This is just a list of the cast. They mean that later on in the article, they're going to talk a little bit more about the sequel. Oh, see, I just, it, it's, it's a weird organization. Your weird organization. Production. Brooks recalled that the inspiration for the film came about from an incident in 1979. I was walking across the parking lot at 20th Century Fox on my way to my office when one of the grips who had worked on high anxiety shouted to me from the back of a moving truck, Hey Mel, what's next? Planning a big one? From out of the blue, the biggest title I could think of popped into my mind. Yes, the biggest movie ever made. It's called History of the World. Someone else on the truck yelled, How can you cover the whole world in one movie? You're right, I shouted. Maybe I'll call it History of the World, Part 1. <laughs> Richard Pryor was to play the role of Josephus, but two days before he was to shoot his part, he was hospitalized with serious burns in a much-publicized incident. Brooks was about to write the part out when Madeline Kahn suggested Gregory Hines. Comicus's arrival at Caesar's Palace was filmed at the Caesar's Palace Hotel in Las Vegas. One scene was removed from the final cut of the film that referred to the Three Mile Island accident. I had a father and a mother, Brooks said, made up to look like half a dog and a half cat as a result of a nuclear meltdown, but the audience was seriously chilled and didn't laugh, so I left it out. Release. Critical reception. The film holds an approval rating of 61% on Rotten Tomatoes based on 33 reviews. It was nominated for Worst Picture at the 1981 <laughs> Stinker's Bad Movie Awards, but lost to Tarzan the Ape Man. The revised ballot, released in 2007, removed its Worst Picture nomination and instead nominated it for Most Painfully Unfunny Comedy, which it won. <laughs> it also garnered a Worst Song nomination at the same ceremony for The Inquisition, lost to Baby Talk from paternity okay so i'm not wrong for like not being into this movie whenever i've seen parts of it um maybe not i mean I'm collectively i like it. not wrong well i mean there are a lot of people who seem to dislike it but i love this movie see i didn't even know that this was like so <laughs> widely criticized i didn't know this no, i wasn't I like presenting just it to you like it's great I, I wasn't jumping on the like... hate train. I just organically came to that conclusion that I'm just like not interested. No, I get it. 
Roger Ebert gave the film two stars out of four and described it as a rambling, undisciplined, sometimes embarrassing failure from one of the most gifted comic filmmakers around. What went wrong? Brooks never seems to have a clear idea of the rationale of this movie, so there's no competent narrative impetus to carry it along. Gene Siskel, however, gave it three stars out of four and said that even though the film borrows heavily from Brooks's previous work, it contains a bunch of solid laughs. Janet Maslin of the New York Times wrote, There are loads of familiarly funny gags in the film, but the movie is so sour that its humor is often undermined because so many of the jokes are either mean-spirited or scatological or both. Pauline Kael of The New Yorker was positive and wrote, It's an all-out assault on taste and taboo, and it made me laugh a lot. Variety called it a disappointingly uneven farce, which serves up a fair share of hearty laughs during its first half, but sputters out long before the close. Sheila Benson of the Los Angeles Times wrote, Presumably, everyone was so busy doing shtick and reacting off each other that there was no one left to mind the story and to say, not funny, not only not funny, but a big overblown crashing bore, fellas. (laughs) <laughs> Gary Arnold of the Washington Post called it an entertaining mishmash of skits which finds Mel Brooks back in lively form for better or for worse to a considerable extent the funny stuff works in a laughing in spite of yourself way Leonard Maltin's film guide gave the movie one and a half out of a possible four stars and stated that the gags range from hilarious to hideous after a while there's no more momentum and it all just lies there despite the efforts of a large comic cast Jonathan Rosenbaum has always championed the film as a guilty pleasure writing that the wonderful stuff is so funny that it makes most of the awful stuff tolerable keep in mind that Brooks is more verbal than visual in orientation and you'll be amply rewarded box office The film opened in 484 theaters the same weekend as Raiders of the Lost Ark and Clash of the Titans and finished fourth for the weekend with a gross of $4.8 million behind Raiders, Clash, and Cheech and Chong's Nice Dreams. With a per-screen average of $10,000, it was Brooks' highest opening on a per-screen basis, despite the strong start poor word of mouth (laughs) impacted its box office. Although it grossed $31.7 million, it was considered a commercial disappointment because the film had been tracking well and Brooks' previous films had been so successful. Home Media History of the World Part 1 was released on DVD. According to the MPAA, it was rated R for crude sexual humor, language, comic violence, sex and nudity, and drug use. In May 2010, it was released on Blu-ray. Sequel series. Here's the part we were talking about. Sequel series. On October 18th, 2021... Hulu and Searchlight Television, the TV division of 20th Century's sister studio, Searchlight Pictures, announced that a sequel variety series called History of the World Part 2 is in the works with a spring 2022 production date scheduled. Mel Brooks is producing and writing the series along with Wanda Sykes, Ike Barinholtz, and Nick Kroll. I can get behind that cast. Wanda Sykes, Ike Barinholtz, and Nick Kroll are solid, funny people. So hopefully it will just be awesome. I didn't even know Mel Brooks was still alive. Mel Brooks is still alive. This has been the Wikipedia page for History of the World Part 1, Part 2. If you want us to read a particular Wikipedia page, please let us know. Thanks for listening to Wikilisten. To support the show, go to patreon.com slash wikilistenpodcast. And find us on social media at Wikilisten and at Wiki 